beneficial symbiosis between humans and machines. As a result, the world's leading organizations aim to have the best of human intelligence and groundbreaking technologies. Immersive technology is a marvel that helps build bridges and bring people together by interconnected immersive environment for achieving cohesiveness and collective goods. Immersive education experiences promote logical reasoning and critical thinking. Moreover, practical hands-on workshops in VR accelerate comprehension of intricate procedures and sequential application of theoretical knowledge. HP has positioned itself as a leader in education by offering a number of programs to increase the effective use of technology in the classroom. The recent inauguration of the HP Innovation Garage in DTEC today aims to demonstrate the latest offering in the fourth industrial revolution technologies. From virtual reality to STEM and even AI, young learners and innovators can attend and join sessions to sharpen their technical awareness on the most trending technologies. I'm joined by Mayan Dingra, Senior Education Business Lead for Middle East, Africa and Eastern Europe at HP. Hi Mayan. Thank you, Sana. Pleasure to be here today. And I'm glad to be able to speak to you about what all HP is doing in the field of immersive education and also online education. So if I were to look at what uh, HP is doing, uh, I look after an area of Middle East, Africa and Eastern Europe. And our focus here has been to help the ministries to combat the crisis in terms of COVID. But apart from that, I think, you know, if you just take a step back just before COVID as well, uh, the world was being driven by a few mega trends in education, you know, apart from blended learning, flipped classroom. Immersive education was turning out to be one of the most important uh, criteria that uh, education was trying to focus on. And, you know, I'd like to ask you a simple question, you know, as an audience. Do you remember the first time you went on a scary roller coaster? Or the time you skied down a steep incline? Or maybe the first scuba dive? And I'm sure some of these memories are deeply etched in your brain. However, if I were to ask you, you know, do you remember the headline of the newspaper from two years back? You'd struggle to remember it, whereas you'd remember a 15-year-old episode of a scuba dive or a roller coaster very, very well. And that is because the immersive part of that engagement, of that experience, created strong anchors for you. And when those strong anchors were created, when that entire sensory experience was uh, so strong to create those anchors, you remembered it well. And that gives us a, a, a view into what happens in learning as well. Because learning is nothing but a function of memory and understanding. And when memory and understanding interweave constantly is when learning takes place. So it takes place in really five phases, right? So the first phase is where you absorb the information being relayed. And, you, and that's a function of memory. The second part is where you process the, and sort out that information, which is really a function of understanding. And then you go into assimilation and sorting out that information, sort of processing it in your brain. So that is, you know, understanding and memory coming together. And then you're obviously asked to recall that information at some stage. And that is when memory comes back into play. And the final part is when you apply that knowledge and that distilled wisdom through the first four steps, which is again an application of understanding. So if this is how learning takes place, then, you know, what we were doing some years back was probably a disservice to education because our uh, way of educating or pedagogy was very one dimensional. It was the equivalent of us looking at you know a book of fishes and trying to get excited about uh, marine life. But you can't get students or kids excited about marine life by looking at drawings in a book. Our current pedagogy luckily has moved away from you know the chalk and talk uh, sort of era and right now we're in that phase where I would call it the equivalent of having an aquarium in front of you and you're looking at uh, the sea life and you know, you're trying to engage with it. So it's a bit interactive, it's a bit more animated and it's a little bit more outcome driven. But really tomorrow is going to be about these immersive experiences which are going to be the equivalent of a scuba dive happening within the ocean, right? We are actually being able to touch and feel and engage with the uh, animal or marine life. And that is what immersive uh, education is going to be about. That is what virtual reality is going to bring to the doorstep of every school, every university in the very near future. So let's look at what's really cooking behind the scenes uh, and, and what does the sort of uh, 
uh, indicator of things to come. Now, if I take one school as an example, Agora School in Netherlands, this school has created an environment which completely immerses the child. They have removed classrooms, they've removed sort of boundaries and barriers. And they have said, we're going to focus on the intrinsic motivation of the child and focus on collaboration and project learning. But beyond that, they have really created an environment where every sense is you know, activated for the child. And they do this in the physical environment as well through virtual reality, uh, you know, augmented through virtual reality. So the school has blended these physical spaces and the virtual reality ability to create a completely unique experience for the children and therefore their ability to engage and remember is far higher than in a normal school. Also, you've got uh, companies like Alchemy uh, VR, right? And, and they have uh, taken on content uh, from David, At David Attenborough's uh, you know, BBC series and created, recreated the whole marine life in the ocean. Now you can actually go and look at prehistoric, historic uh, marine life and current marine life all in almost real life sort of uh, environment. So imagine the ability of children to now understand what's happening in the ocean. Imagine the retention that they're going to have and the ability for them to then make a difference in tomorrow's uh, climate change programs or ocean safe programs because you have now completely engaged them and immersed them in, in this environment. Similarly, you've got a company called Boulevard, which is, you know, taken on uh, a project to bring to life through virtual reality all the major museums around the world. So you can now take children across 500 museums probably without having them to step out of the classroom. So you get them interested in art, you get them interested in uh, humanity, you get them interested in history in such an interesting and engaging way. And just, you know, in our own neighborhood, we've got Munfarid, which is doing similar exciting things on uh, virtual reality. So the, f the future frontier is definitely about bringing virtual reality and LMSs together, right? And how do you create the most engaging digital environment for children? Uh, you of course need, you know, powerful devices for that. And HP has brought about some really interesting headsets now under the Reverb brand. And we've got computing back power, uh, which is on your backpack. So you're no longer tethered to a cable. So your ability to be boundaryless, to really feel that experience and immerse yourself is now multifold, right? One of the other places where I think, you know, virtual reality is going to make a big difference is in bridging the skill gap. Because today, skilling and reskilling is, or upskilling, is one of the biggest problems being faced by countries. And the dichotomy is that the minute you try and bridge the gap on one skill, five other skills go out of either fashion or need to be reskilled on. So you've got countries like Japan, which you would uh, think are sort of high up in the skill uh, bracket, but they have an 81% uh, shortage of skilled staff according to their surveys. And that is because we are training uh, students in academia, but we are not training them in competencies. And if you look at India as another example, you know, out of the 150,000 engineering graduate, graduates in 2015, only 20% were employable because the competencies and soft skills that were required were not really built up. And therefore, you have companies like Virtual Speech, which have now created these entire programs on taking emotional quotient, situational intelligence, and real-time experiences into a virtual reality environment and upskilling and reskilling uh, students to be ready for the new world. So this is sort of another area where I think you know virtual reality is going to really help at doing things at scale and at cost and building up the workforce of tomorrow. Now. Accessibility is, I think, one of the biggest social problems that we have. So, you know, when we look at remote areas and we say that we want to take education into these remote areas, we face the problem of accessibility. And that is going to get sorted out in two ways, right? So even before COVID, you had 263 million children out of school. And the fact is that these children need both devices and the network, right? And so once you get 5G coming into these countries and transforming the ability to broadband and stream things and the ability to get access and then you intersect that into remote areas and you have a position there when you get a remote child from a village in uh, from a village in Ethiopia and a child from a remote village in India to be able to interact in a virtual classroom so you can they can go with their digital avatars go into a virtual classroom learn about the world and actually look at solving local issues and taking that at global scale so that is when you know virtual reality is going to come to its true power, which is to take on local issues, get students across the globe to be interacting, collaborating, and 
solve these at scale at a global level, right? So the future is definitely going to be inclusive and immersive in education. And HP is going to play a leading role in that. And it's going to be part of our entire uh, commitment to enable the better learning outcomes for 100 million people. Addressing the learning crisis in Africa, HP is playing a notable role in supporting the goals of the continental education strategy in Africa. Can you please share more about this? So, you know, I think the continental education strategy, which was set in 2016 for the next nine years, is, I think, a really robust document which has created a framework for all the 55 member states to look at what needs to be done in education in their, uh, particular, in their uh, own countries. And it lays, lays out 12 strategic objectives. And against those 12 strategic objectives, you can actually pair them into six themes, you know, starting off from uh, teacher development to ICT and data enhancement to accessibility and, and so on. Now, what we have done as HP is to map all our programs and pair them against these six broad themes. So when we look at teacher development, we have got programs like, uh, you know, H HP Teaching Fellows and we are actually creating another program called HP IDEA. And these programs are actually going to look at the capability development of teachers in Africa. Uh, when you look at accessibility, we have got programs like Be Online and we've got programs like Classroom of the Future. So we are making sure that we have got access and technology into the classroom so that blended education can truly take place. From an ICT framework point of view, we've got you know, DASA, which is the Digitally Advanced Schools of Africa program. So we've mapped that against that. Uh, from inclusivity and you know, uh, gender sensitivity point of view, we have taken on uh, Girl Rising, which is a part of our uh, framework, and brought that into Africa. And then we're looking at other programs like HP Life, which is a set of 32 modules of business and ID skills. And we mapped that against the TIVIT and the higher education strategy of CESA. So we have created a whole mapping and tapestry of our programs against CESA. And so I think we have been uniquely positioned to be able to deliver against the CESA objectives. And that is why recently African Union Commission also onboarded us as one of the partner programs uh, to combat the effect of COVID in the continent. Really amazing talk. Thank you so much for joining us, Mayank. Thank you, Sana.